Now, you've seen reports or films or you know movies even showing UFOs gathering like this and locking together like a flock of birds even in the 50s over the White House. This is why they did that, because it is efficient and uh, as they get together in triangular pieces and make bigger and bigger formations, it is easier for them to conserve energy, to communicate with each other because the fields between them, the, the, the vibrating fields, are mechanical and you can talk between the ships without going to radio just by using the vibration in the field. You can actually shout if you wanted to. Uh, it wouldn't be as efficient, but it's modulating with just voice level audio. When these craft get together like that, if you wanted to, you could, you could stretch a, well, a blimp, a fake flying saucer of any shape you want over the top of it and under the bottom of it and snap the edges shut and the guy on the ground is going to say, wow, look at that 450 foot long UFO. But if you take the cover off, it's, you know, 10, 12, 15 of these guys all hooked together. Now, modern physicists, when approached with the problem of supporting a craft in the air for 10 minutes or more in one spot, right here, I've, I've debated some of them, the heads of theoretical physics in universities, and I've managed to frustrate every one of them. They say, well, oh, 10 minutes, the amount of fuel you need. I mean, look at the space shuttle for crying out loud. You, you couldn't sit right there for 10 minutes. Or you couldn't carry enough fuel on board. I say, well, hmm, you got a blackboard? You see this little basket here and these little wires and stuff? And this is a hot air balloon over the top of it here. You see where I'm going with this? See, this guy's been here three hours sitting here with a hot air balloon. Well, that's different. That's different. That's uh, specific gravity. Uh, it, it, that has nothing to do with this. I say, well, now why does that balloon float? Because the hydrogen gas in it is less dense but more energetic fuel per particle? Yeah. Okay, so in other words, if I could magically generate a field in and around a craft using normal air or something else that was just like hydrogen but contained, then I could float that thing there because it's not, the energy's not going where it's contained in the field. I had one guy get some anti pictures chalk off his desk and threw it at me and stomped out the door. But... But it's there, that's the truth. Now, so when you see a large ship, if you do, I mean a large ship, like half a mile in diameter or something, and you have an engineer tell you, it can't be real. If it is, it's not from around here because, you know, half a mile long lever arm on a wing or a portion of it, if that thing moved up and down like that, it would rip the thing apart just from, you know, the, the lever action on the joints. What they haven't considered, very simple point, what I showed you there with those, the, the, the saucers gathering together to make a bigger craft, each one of them still has its own local gravity. And the stretch would only be 30, 40, 50 feet, and we do more than that on a, a standard uh, airliner wing. So when you have gravitational posts all through this immense structure, uh, and it's all linked together, and the command pilot that's linked them all together and, and firing the system, Everything accelerates uniformly. There's no big drama. There's no heavy torque on the joints. It is possible and within the realm of modern physics. It's just that you didn't see how Houdini did it. And that's what we're playing with. Some will be real and some will be a Trojan horse, I'm sure. And this is what you would um, probably see. That was neat. Got to have one. As Will Smith said, I think, what was it, in the 4th of July? I've got to get me one of these. <laughs> in Batman, didn't he? Okay. In 19, well, in the late 50s, in Strategic Air Command, um, there was a friend of mine uh, who was a colonel. Um, he became a friend of mine later colonel in the Air Force, and he was a commander of a SAC aircraft, a bomber aircraft, and um, Colonel Dice um, had a navigator on board that uh, he knew quite well. Younger fellow, obviously, captain, I think. And one day the captain came to me and says, uh, Colonel, he says, look, I'm going to give you a sealed envelope here, and I want you to hold it for me. I've got a duplicate that uh, I have at home, and I've filed another one that's in the mail that's coming to me, certified mail, but I want you to keep a copy until I tell you otherwise. And George said, well, what's in it? And he said, well, I did something at home the other night, an experiment I've been playing with, that is absolutely astounding. 
and I'm going to tell you this, and the drawings and the plans for it are in this envelope, and it's real. And he said, I, I went into the, the garage where I was setting this up, and I had some chipboard, um, compressed board, what do you call it here? You know, particle board, yeah. Uh, look, I was in Australia so long that I get my, my terms confused. I do apologize, so you'll have to give me credit for that anyway. And he said, I put three levels, like a cake, of particle board together, and I put some washers and coils on it and some rods, which we're going to look at here. And he said, I hooked it up to the, uh, the uh, signal generator set there, the, the frequency, and um, I fired it up and nothing happened. And I thought, surely I would see some magnetic effects from it. And he said, all of a sudden, it started to lift up off the, the workbench, just slowly lifting up. And he said, I was amazed. And I, wow, what have I got here, you know? And started to lift up a little bit further. And he said, wow, look, at the air is kind of ugh, mottled gray and kind of, yeah. Wow. Oh, if I stick my hand in it, I won't feel hurt. Hmm. I'll grab this broomstick. It's not conductive. Ah, it feels like jello you're going through. Wow, it's a field. Well, I'll just turn that off. We'll do that again. He reaches over here to these knife clips he's got for the power supply. And he pulls it back like this. And it goes, and a big arc double arc jumps over and gaps the air and keeps on running the spark in the air without the thing. He says, oh dear, can't, can't shut it off. And he said, um, hmm, well, and he takes this broom handle and goes whack like that and hits this gray area under the, the floating thing. Well, then it all stopped, but it was a huge electrical discharge. Down the pole up into the mains blew the power transformer on the block and, well, power company came out the next day. Darn this thing, he said, I, I don't know what has happened. I was sitting out here watching TV and it just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he had anti-gravity. So he gave this to George and George told me about it years later. I said, George, where's that envelope? This is before I left to work with Teller's Group. So I, my mom and dad moved to Florida. I, I think it's in my boxes there. I said, well, did you ever open it? He said, no. I said, well, what happened to the navigator? He said, Oh, you know, come to think of it, a few weeks after that he was transferred out, I never saw him again. I thought, small wonder. All right, so I filed that away. Then, a few, well, probably a few months later, I was recruited by Teller's Group, and I got to see why what the navigator did worked. Now, up there at the top left is how he wound one set of washer and rod. And then he put them into this on particle board. 15 degree spacing as we twisted the various layers apart. And when I was later into the real guys, this is the application of one of his coils and rods. And that's the inside of a 30-foot diameter, human-made anti-gravity craft. It's as simple as that. What I don't have here are some things that I will um, probably not show publicly for safety reasons, but I'll explain that. In the real craft,